Good morning. Uh, can people hear me? Are we unmuted? Okay. Um, my name is Susan Kern. I have the great pleasure to moderate today's session called Maryland and the World, a roundtable discussion about truth and reconciliation. And what you're going to hear today is about five projects that uh, challenge us to think about what's special about Maryland and Southern Maryland in particular uh, as uh, these people present uh, the, these um, community-based and, and collective projects that, that give us a, a new face of history here. So I'm going to just briefly introduce the projects and then as each group of presenters gets up, they will tell you, you will learn more about who they are and about their projects. So we'll be hearing first uh, about commemorative to enslaved people of Southern Maryland at St. Mary's College of Maryland. Uh, by Dr. Uh, Julie King and Dr. Tawanda Jordan joining us virtually. We'll hear about the Restored Planters House at Thomas Stone National Historic Site in Charles County uh, from uh, Mrs. Stone Browder, uh, uh, Major Allen B. Taylor, and Dr. Amy Speckert. Um, we'll hear uh, about a virtual project called Still We Speak, Community Archaeology and Jesuit Enslaved Ancestors from Dr. Dr. Laura Mazur. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. William Thomas on OSEC and you see early Washington DC law and family, another virtual project uh, that's uh, incredibly exciting. Uh, and then we will hear from uh, Mrs. Julie Hawkins Annis uh, about uh, genealogical and descendant based research uh, using ancestry.com and DNA analysis. So uh, my job is, is simply to moderate uh, and um, uh, you know, help solve any problems here. So I'll turn this over to Dr. King, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great, so thank you for that. And thank you, Susan. And I would like to begin by thanking Amy uh, Specker for organizing this session and for, my, for inviting President Jordan and me to uh, participate in it. Um, President Jordan and I are co-presenting today about St. Mary's College of Maryland's efforts to come to grips with the college's entanglement with slavery and to, the, and to move the needle uh, forward on truth and reconciliation in Southern Maryland, where we are based. As many of you know, Southern Maryland was, for most of its post-settler history, a rural farming community, and on the eve of the Civil War, enslaved people nearly equal, equal free people. Additionally, free Blacks were a significant part of the popul population. Um, and let me see if I can get the, um, for the archaeologists, <laughs> This means that the quarter sites for the enslaved are not unusual in the region, and I'm an archaeologist by background. Uh, this is true for St. Mary's City, the first colonial settlement in the region in 1634, and where St. Mary's College is located. Enslaved people were in St. Mary's City at its founding in 1634, and they lived in law quarters scattered across the landscape when the school was created in 1838 um, to commemorate the colonial settlement. Records indicate that enslaved people worked to support the school. Uh, today, efforts to preserve the rural landscape around the school and protect its view shed, done in deference to the 17th century colonial settlement, preserve and protect a landscape of slavery. Uh, quarter sites are not therefore a surprising find, um, especially on a campus that has grown substantially since 1838. The discovery of quarters in 2016, however, was different. Uh, typically, archaeological work um, done in tandem with campus development is contracted out to our sister state agency or to private consulting firms. In 2016, the work was done in-house with college faculty and staff directly involved. Uh, the national political context, the end of Barack Obama's uh, term as president, and the election of Donald Trump, whose candidacy, candidacy was propelled by, among other things, racially charged themes, revealed in stark terms the nation's unfinished work 
um, reckoning with the history of slavery. The discovery of a complex of quarter sites along the principal road into old St. Mary's City and the growing local mm -hmm. realization uh, that this reckoning must begin at home propelled St. Mary's College into action. Uh, the college reached out to the local and regional community, privileging the voice, the voices of the descendant community to reimagine that reckoning in the landscape itself, a landscape that, as noted, is essentially uh, a preserved landscape of slavery. So I'd like to invite President Jordan uh, to continue our presentation. Thank you, Julie. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good morning. Um, the context of the time is significant, as context usually is. It is important to note that St. Mary's College is a monument school. That designation can take on many meanings. To me, it means that we are committed to understanding the history of the place and to educate all so that we can benefit from the lessons and become better humans. This discovery of artifacts from separate and distinct centuries spurred a different kind of acknowledgement of the time period in this corner of the world. For the first time, the history of enslaved people was foregrounded in this landscape and became part of a conversation about what that means for the college, as well as for the local and broader Southern Maryland communities. The community was invited to imagine how this history could be interpreted and shared. The college held a campus-wide meeting at which we announced the discovery of the quarters, told what was known about the slaveholders as well as the enslaved, and discussed the impact of the findings on the construction of our new athletics facility. Campus and external community experts were invited to contextualize the findings. At this initial meeting, we took the time to allow the community to respond to the news and hear their initial thoughts. In the following weeks, a committee comprising faculty, students, staff, external community members, and alumni was charged to hold a series of focus groups for both internal and external stakeholders to brainstorm ways we could commemorate the findings and have this discovery become part of the living history of the college and the community. A list was developed and the number one choice of the community was to have a contemplative site constructed near the quarters. For the project concept presentation from the finalists, the entire campus and broader communities were invited to attend and cast their votes. The winning presentation was chosen from the group that was the most attuned to our campus setting and culture, especially our love for Lucille Clifton's poetry who paid attention to the themes we'd often written about that focused on making the invisible visible and providing voices to the voiceless and for our desire for contemplative reflection and celebration. The edifice of the commemorative in and of itself captures most of these. The words, however, take the acknowledgement to a higher level. Quentin Baker, the poet, used erasure poetry to provide the voice for the voiceless. And having pulled the words from original slave documents made the invisible visible. He captured the pain and inhumanity of the era, as well as celebrated the strengths and triumphs of the enslaved people. It is a commemorative that pulls you into the era and forces you to reflect on the role your ancestors may have had in the past and the role you play in shaping the present and future of this nation. I invite you all to come and experience it. <laughs> our acknowledgement of the era and our role in it did not end with the erection of the structure. As indicated, our community developed a list of activities and initiatives in which we are to be engaged to live up to our being a monument school. These include developing an inclusive curriculum with courses offered every semester focused on the era and or its impact on the nation today, an annual celebration known as the Sacred Journey centered on the commemorative, development of a historical walking path and tour of campus, and importantly, <laughs> land acknowledgement and pledge that includes both the indigenous and enslaved peoples who lived on the land. 
I believe that from these continuous efforts, you can see that St. Mary's College is actively engaged in and committed to truth and reconciliation. I now turn it back over to Julie to conclude our presentation. So um, my slides I uh, didn't share uh, uh, share, so I'm going to show them to you because I think it's really important for you to see the commemorative. Um, especially after hearing what Dr. Jordan had to say. So I'm just going to buzz through them really briefly. And there's the commemorative. You get a sense of it with the uh, use of erasure poetry uh, light. And then this is the setting that it's located in. And I'll conclude the remarks of President Jordan and me by saying that while preparing for the session, Amy Speckert had asked presenters, what makes Southern Maryland unique? You know that we would have our own uh, presentation. And I want to suggest that Southern Maryland is not really unique. Um, to be sure, for example, and we'll hear about this in a little bit, um, the Jesuit event in 1838 with the sale of enslaved people to brokers in Louisiana uh, was an event that we will be thinking about for a long time. Um, but we must guard against placing this responsibility solely on the Jesuits. Um, the domestic slave trade or the sale of enslaved people to free people was practiced not only by the Jesuits, um, but enslavers beginning in the 17th century um, and continuing into the 19th. Um, it was practiced by the Anglicans in St. Mary's City uh, and by Catholic and Anglican enslavers throughout the Southern Maryland region. The domestic trade in humans was horrific, devastating, terrifying, and for enslavers, everyday work. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. King, Dr. Jordan, for starting us off. I want to thank Susan Kern for moderating today, and I want to thank the organizers of the Lemon Project Symposium for giving us an opportunity to talk about multiple perspectives on truth and reconciliation in Southern Maryland. I also want to acknowledge briefly uh, my, my dissertation advisor, Ron Hoffman, uh, the late Ron Hoffman, uh, Director of the Omohundro Institute and Professor of History here at William and Mary. He was devoted to Maryland history, and I think he would have been pleased to see actually the second of two panels on Maryland at the Lemon Project Symposium. About five years ago, I was hired as a contract historian to write a historic resource study of Promistown National Historic Site in Charles County, Maryland, shown on the map roughly uh, within that green circle just off of the Potomac River. My job was to study the historical and geographical context of an 18th century plantation owned by Thomas Stone, who was a 
lawyer, a planter, and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Who's, you know, I use up to date scholarship, including the published work of several people here on this panel. And I applied the skills that I developed as a historian here at William and Mary. As the nation approaches the 250th anniversary of 1776 <clears throat> in 2026, worth noting that Thomas Stone National Historic Site is in a sense a child of the bicentennial of 1976. Uh, the nation's birthday fireworks are fairly cooled when on New Year's Day 1977, the fire destroyed a good part of the house that Thomas Stone built for his family. The Congress stepped in, purchased the property from private hands, and turned it over to the National Park Service to commemorate the life of the public life of Thomas Stone. And for various reasons, interpretation at the house remains largely centered on Thomas Stone and his immediate family members. My sense is that the National Park Service wants to be more inclusive and expansive about the narrative being told at national at the at the park if it can find the evidence. Sure. To my mind, Alan and Brenda represent the next wave. Who will uh, have them speak next? Alan Brenda represent the next wave of descendant informed interpretation, an approach that combines DNA analysis, historical documentation with oral tradition. The three of us bonded through the mutual pursuit of truth about ancestors and ancestry in Charles County. I'll hand it over to Alan again. Hello, everyone. I am so pleased to be here uh, to give you a brief history of the story that I found out after a Zoom with Amy, Dr. Amy, Dr. Amy Specker. I just uh, signed up for the, the Zoom through David Lassen, who is a ranger at Thomas Stone National Park. So I am the daughter of Irvin Z. Stone. This is uh, youngest daughter. And I was curious as to where my stone maiden name came from. Um, I, I uh, have an uncle, Uncle Alfred Stone, who was our family historian. He has now passed. However, his work needs to, to continue. He put a lot of effort into uh, doing a, an extensive family tree. However, it stopped at a point. Uh, he worked with my older sister and they did a publication and also they um, have, have the family tree. So when I uh, first discovered, I, I moved here with my husband in 2012 in Maryland. We came from Ohio by way of Kentucky, where my parents were born and raised. And I did little did I know that I would be in the midst of my forefathers. On my maternal side, my great-great-grandfather was raised, was born in Anne Arundel County. And then through my research, I found out as, from my curiosity, where did the stone name come from? That Thomas Stone and his family were in Charles County. So I'm right in the middle in Prince George's County. So I thought, how ironic that I would move. You know, I felt a pull to come this way. And uh, for years, actually, <clears throat> 40 years before I finally got in this area from Ohio. <laughs> and once I got here, I started the research. And I said, well, hmm. my parents said that we came from slavery. We were, um, our forefathers were slaves. And I'm like, is that true? Let me find out. I said, if so, then this maiden name Stone could be connected. So I started researching the name Stone. 
and I found in Charles County, Thomas Stone. I did my DNA and it did link to Governor William Stone. Little did I know at the same time that my nephew, Alan Taylor, was doing the same research and had come to the same conclusion. We did not know we were both researching at the same time. My sister, his mother said, you're researching this and this is what you found? Well, my son is researching and he's found the same thing. He lives in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, and I'm in, in Maryland. So we uh, connected with each other. She connected us. Uh, we, we had been to the gatherings and talked to the family, but never knew we were both researching. And um, so my background in journalism, you know, you want to know a little bit about everything. Maybe not be an expert, but you <laughs> want that information. So it was time for our reunion in 2019. We all know what happened in 2019. So we couldn't gather together. And I had promised the family that we would do the, the reunion in Maryland. So they, um, we did a Zoom. I had, I had been met David Lassman, Ranger David Lassman from Thomas Stone um, the Historical Site. And he, he agreed that it would be great to have it there. My husband and I had toured the, the property before you know, we had decided. And um, so David was very accommodating. I, I did my due diligence to have the reunion there. And we had about 55 family members show up at the reunion which was great. Some were receptive, some were a little bit apprehensive. You know, is this really the story? So through, you know, research, if we have researchers in the room, it's ongoing, and especially when you're running after a brick, you're running into a brick wall. So if the research is ongoing and we have made lots of discoveries as to the connection, and I am going to turn it over to my nephew, Alan. I'm sorry. Major Taylor, <laughs> and they will continue um, and tell you the rest of the story. All right, thank you very much. Oh, the reunion, one thing, Alan and I designed the t-shirt, that's the back of our t-shirt for the reunion. Yeah, okay, good morning, good morning. All right, I guess she left me with the hardest part, I guess. <laughs> but it is true, we both started researching about the same time. And uh, what really sparked my interest was a couple of things. One is my daughter originally started uh, first. She uh, was given a DNA test I, uh, um, in 2015. And uh, she came running back to me. Um, first, I thought it was for entertainment use only. If you read the labels back in the early days of 2015, about the time when Ancestry came out, a lot of people were using it as entertainment, just kind of blowing off the, the uh, what that material would reveal. So she came to me and said, Dad, I got Native American. And I'm like, wow, where, how, where'd that come from? Uh, had no idea, no clue. So I said, that's kind of interesting, but we never did anything with it. And then a year later, uh, I, became a uh, subscriber of Ancestry. I submitted my DNA and it popped up, said the same thing. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. Never knew. So um, I started digging and that's about the time when um, Aunt Brenda was, was digging as well. And we started kind of digging together. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great term because that's what it takes to, to get your information. So when you look at this chart here, it's quite interesting. Uh, it starts off with Governor William Stone and it ends here with my grandfather, Irvin Z. Stone. If you look at his name, this is one of my interesting, uh, this is what kind of prompted me to do what I did. If you look at his name, Irvin Z. Stone, that's two surnames joined together. And I never knew, I thought his name was Irvin. I mean, no big deal. We've had people that we know named Irvin. But if you go backwards here and you kind of get right to this point right here, you see that Irvin right there, and then all the rest of them are stones. Well, there's an interesting um, story behind that. Um, the woman, Minerva, of course, is a DNA stone. She is the daughter of William Stone, and she married an Adam. Uh, he's not listed on here. Uh, an Adam Irving, and he died at a very young age at 26 years old. Uh, he, he had opposed, you know, we knew only of one son which is William 
McCallahan Irving. Um, they only knew of one son, but there's actually two. Uh, one is uh, the descendant that, that I'm from. Uh, he's a progenitor of our family. Uh, and his name is Alexander Stone. He was given his mother's name, Stone. So here's the thing that's interesting. I, I don't want to get off track real quick. Uh, the Irvins and the Stones meet up together in Madison County, Kentucky in about 1790. They, they are both uh, wealthy landowners. They are both very instrumental in the development of Madison County, especially in the earlier moments. They became the governors, the the clerks, the uh, the people who did a lot of decisions back in those days, um, and somehow they came together. And if you and if you you know have the time to do the research, it, it's complicated because our family doesn't have a lot of history written down, uh, opposed to some of the other families. So I had to research the Euro side heavily in order to get the African side of the family. And once you do that. They they come together and it's it, it's quite um, it's almost like a uh, like a, uh, a a sheet of music it comes together and we've discovered that the surname Irving and the surname Stone is joined together because of the birth of 1825. Uh, this gentleman right here is listed in many 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 documents as being white, but he's actually of color. And uh, when you start going through that information, you'll see documents that start to appear. Uh, outside of the family that that they had no control of, like governmental papers, like tax papers, and he is listed as a person of color. So, uh, but he's passing or living quite well uh, in other uh, respects. But we did find him. We did find some stuff. We're still working on it. So that's that's how we come to be stones. But here's the thing that's interesting. I have an uncle, Irvin Z. Stone uh, Jr., who is alive, living in the state of Washington. I submitted his DNA to another company that, that tests only the Y chromosome. And when the chromosome came back, he, the, the, the study said, you are not a stone. And I'm like, oh, I'm not a stone. What do you mean? All these years, you know, everyone, her name is Brenda Stone. You have to change every document she's ever had. <laughs> but it's not true. And, and I said, wow, how is that possible? She said, but there, she's looking at my DNA. She's more detailed than I am. And she said, but there is stone in here. That's quite, uh, that's unusual. We don't understand. And I'm like, well, we have to figure this out because I've never heard of the word Irving before. Never thought about my grandfather being an Irving. And it revealed that uh, the earliest known ancestor that my uncle connected to was a David C. Irving, which is the father, uh, you know, as you go through the Irving line, he's the one that came from, from Ireland in the 1700s. He's the one that came to Virginia, Rockingham County, Virginia. And he, of course, ended up in Charles in uh, Madison County, Kentucky, and then that's where we kind of intersect that. So it's quite an interesting story. I wish we had more time. We've could we've put together a research paper. My aunt and I. There's some information in here that's really good. Of course, it's always ongoing. Uh, the research is never 100% complete. There's always some uh, issues or things that you can't really find, like uh, birth documents. But the DNA speaks for itself. We know that DNA now is more advanced than it has ever been. And whenever you see the information, you have to kind of look and believe what you see. And you also triangulate and try to disprove what you see. And that's what I've done. We've looked at it this way. We've, we've had hypotheses on this side. We've done this, we've done this. And it always comes out to be the same. So I think we're, we're pretty, we're pretty uh, happy at what we've found in the last five years. So that's pretty much all I have. Unless there's any other questions, or who am I turning it to? Uh, Dr. Bowles. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And we'll we'll have time for questions. After okay. That's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you all hear me? Oh. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Okay, let me make sure I can navigate here. 
Okay, thank you so much to, to Amy for putting this project together. This is, you know, it's it's hard to follow so many wonderful projects and I'm, I'm so excited to hear what, what you, all of you are working on. Um, my own project is very much um, intimately connected with the same part of Maryland uh, where, where St. Mary's College is located. Whenever I go out to the site where, where we were digging, I, I'd pass right by St. Mary's College um, and historic St. Mary, Mary's City. So uh, the history that I'm looking at is related specifically to the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, um, and the, the communities of people that they enslaved. Um, so when you look at the history, you can see the map here of locations where the Society of Jesus who come, you know, various missionaries come with the early founding of Maryland. Um, one of the things that they do in order to have land to, to make money to fund their missions um, is, is they buy property. And, and these purchases, particularly in Southern Maryland, I, I put the, the dates here for um, those foundation, those foundational dates. Um, but the, you can see that it extends well outside of Southern Maryland. Um, ostensibly, these plantations are established to support missions, but also to support educational institutions. Um, and you can see Georgetown is not founded for, you know, 150 years after um, the first land purchases are made. Um, and so um, one of the important elements of this history, probably the most important element of these, this history is by the early 18th century, um, the money made on these plantations is off of the labor of enslaved persons. Um, the, the beginnings of that are, are difficult to document. Um, but when we look at that history, what, what ultimately happens is that enslaved persons are you know, not only members of a community, not only laborers, but they are also capital. They're seen as capital. And so when there are financial problems, they're sold. Um, there are a series of sales that begin around the time of the American Revolution and really culminate with a, a large sale in 1838. Um, and so you can see that the image of the um, article that really broke the news that of, of what Georgetown has been working on, um, making sense of documenting and trying to make reparations for this, this history. So what I've been working on for the past, going, going on 10 years, is looking at the archaeology of these plantation sites. And actually, Dr. King was, was instrumental in, in some of the, the projects, like the, the first image that you can see here um, at, at St. Inigo's in Southern Maryland. So you can see that highlighted circled in uh, orange. Um, basically trying to make sense of where the earliest parts of these sites are, are located. Um, so there have been significant past projects. And so one of the things that I've done is to try and um, take a look at the, the past archeology span that's been done, bring that all together. Um, and this has led to um, a, an ongoing project right now that's funded by um, a generous grant through the Maryland Historical Trust. And one of the things that we've done as part of this project is to really uh, work closely with um, communities, uh, who's, who, people whose ancestors were enslaved here. Um, and this, is, this has been done by you know, inviting community members out on site to join us. Um, and I'm hoping you know, as we move forward, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're working on right now, that you know, we're working more closely with the Society of Jesus, with um, the Catholic Church as an institution um, to try and make sure that descendants have a say in how sites are interpreted and weigh in about important priorities. So one of the things we've done is, is have monthly Zoom calls um, where we talk about um, talk about archaeology, we talk about, um, you know, sort of priorities for sites. Um, we also talk about, you know, where this information should go. So you can see some of the results of our archaeological research. You're seeing a map of ground penetrating radar anomalies. Um, this is a manor house at Newtown in Maryland, so uh, also in St. Mary's County. Um, and this is St. Francis Xavier Church. So this is a, a complex, very condensed complex um, and it's a it's an active church today. Um, but what you're seeing here are different anomalies related to um, probably to structures. Um, and I just finished putting together the catalog so you can see some of these artifacts. Uh, one of the things that's most um, fascinating to me is that, you know, we can take a look at where perhaps the homes of enslaved persons are. And so what you're seeing on the map here, 
You can see up here, there's a foundation of a hearth. You can see um, it's this cabin that's um, in, a, in a photograph from 1882. Um, there's also what appears to be a um, uh, foundation. Um, and these are the, based on the, the artifacts, um, these are consistent with um, the homes of enslaved persons. Um, one of the other important elements of our project is, uh, you know, finding a way to make sure that this information is accessible. Um, certainly, we, you know, a lot of archaeological reports, you know, they end up in academic publications, they end up in, um, you know, in technical reports, but um, in working with the community, there are a lot of questions about, well, why aren't our kids taught these things in school? Why? Um, why is this something I'm just learning about now? Why am I just learning about the fact that, you know, the reason my family is Catholic is because of this connection to the Society of Jesus. And so um, we put together a website called Still We Speak. Um, this is a name that, that one of the descendants um, came up with and, and the community um, generally uh, agreed on. Um, and we showcase a lot of different elements of, you know, the archaeology of these different sites, the history of these different sites, and, and really try and set up information. And again, this is a work in progress, but try and set up information so that that this information can be integrated um, into to schools and, and that the information is available. Um, so to give one example, uh, many of the, the lovely, wonderful descendants I've, I've interacted with are descendants of Louisa Mahoney Mason. Um, and this is, um, I think it's yet to be confirmed, uh, absolutely, um, but this is likely Louisa Mahoney Mason here in front of a house. Um, and, and one of the things we, we went to some of the archaeological collections that were excavated about 25 years ago, um, and, and, you know, I don't always know what, what artifact is going to be meaningful to community members. Um, but this is one that, that really stuck out. Um, this is actually a, a doorknob um, from the house where, where Louisa Mahoney Mason likely lived. Um, and so we um, worked with um, Bernard Means at VCU to do 3D scanning of objects because, again, many of the descendants are, are living in Louisiana, um, living in Missouri, living in, all across the country. And so we wanted to try and make these sites accessible um, in a way. And so this is just one example of, of the many artifacts that we've been, been putting together and 3D scanning. The final part of the project um, is related to a cemetery. Again, another one of the, the former plantations at Sacred Heart Church. Um, the, the plantation was known as White Marsh. Um, and this is in Prince George's County. I'm actually joining you from there today because there's a big uh, cemetery cleanup event going on despite, despite the rain. There's a, a bunch of uh, Gonzaga um, high school students out um, cleaning up, clearing up pricker bushes in the woods. Um, because a large cemetery was identified, and many of the descendants knew about this cemetery. Um, and they've been, you know, raise, trying to raise, raise awareness, trying to make sure that the cemetery is cleaned up and maintained. And it's finally happening now. And so I'm working um, to document grave markers and to, um, you know, try and, and, and map in and, and work and, and do, again, ground penetrating radar. I'm, I'm not doing that work. We're working with, with collaborators, but try and make sure that um, this place, this place that is a sacred place is recognized as such and memorialized as such. And so I've been um, very gratified to work with members of the community. And I'm sure, you know, you'll, you'll hear from, from Julie Hawkins Ennis soon um, about um, you know, the community, because she's one of, one of the folks who's been, been coming out and, and instrumental in, in pushing the project forward. Um, but it's been a really, um, really important uh, project to, to restore dignity um, to this forgotten cemetery. Thank you, Laura. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. William Thomas, who is also joining us virtually. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of, of the Lemon Project, and it's uh, it's a, a delight and an honor to be here with you today. Um, Amy Speckert for the invitation and Susan Kern for moderating and for all my fellow panelists. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, my project, our project, um, and you should be able to see uh, my screen. Is that is that right? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so um, I've been working since 2010 on a digital project uh, called Ose oh Can You See? It started off as a project about uh, freedom suits in Washington, D.C., filed in the D.C. Circuit Court. And um, eventually we collected more than 600 freedom suits by enslaved people, ma many families, uh, and they're all available on this site, uh, publicly available, shareable, uh, and I hope you'll visit it and, and go through those uh, those cases. Uh, these are cases that were in the Washington, D.C. Circuit Court, cases that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, but I also, um, as you'll see in a moment, began following these cases back in time uh, and forward in time, um, back in time to the predecessor cases in Maryland, and especially on the western shore of Maryland in southern Maryland. And um, and then forward in time to the descendants of the families today, descendants of those who sued for freedom. And so my journey on this uh, over this last decade has really been both one uh, as a scholar, but also uh, a personal journey of grief and reconciliation. And I wanna share that uh, with you um, this morning. Uh, so, um, okay, everybody can see that. All right, if I got, thank you, Laura. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so much of this story is is in a, a book that came out several years ago called "The Question of Freedom: The Families Who Challenged Slavery from the Nation's Founding to the Civil War." And we've been asked to talk about, you know, why is Maryland important? Um, well. I, I think after thinking about this and looking at the so many of the freedom suits, Maryland's the location of the most significant freedom suits in American history. That's that's what I try to um, put together in this book. And uh, uh, the families who brought these freedom suits, uh, particularly the Queen family and the Mahoney family, suing uh, the Jesuit priests at White Marsh. We just heard from Laura about White Marsh and Sacred Heart today. Um, those, those families brought lawsuits against the Jesuits that went to the Supreme Court and they challenged, um, they were the longest constitutional legal challenge to slavery in American history, spanning five generations. So Maryland has this absolutely crucial history of freedom suit that I think um, we, we need to share and know more about. Um, these freedom suits tell us a story across Maryland and the world. Um, they connect Maryland to the transatlantic slave trade. They connect Maryland to um, British precedent in the English courts in London. Uh, that is what the Queen and, and families argued, that their ancestors had been in London and therefore uh, the principle of freedom, the Somerset principle, applied to them. And they tried to bring that principle into Maryland's courts and into the Supreme Court of the United States. And so this story is immensely significant in American history. But I think the truth of the story, and we've been asked uh, by uh, Susan today to talk about the, the truth. Um, I think the truth of this history, uh, what it helps us see is that slavery was not nameless and faceless, right? Um, that's, um, Americans, I think, have an abstract understanding of slavery. Slavery, they, they, slavery as a, just the term, suggests an abstractness. And um, what I've wanted to do with the digital project and with the book and as you'll see in a moment with a series of films, is to try to center the experience of particular families, of named families, of the Queen family, of the Mahoney family, of the Shorter family, of the Butler family, of the Thomas family, of the Duckett family. Ex particular families should be at the center of this story of American history, 
And that may help us move away from a sense of exceptional stories of resistance. Um, uh, every American practically knows uh, the name Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman. And they're in our, but they're in a way they're in our textbooks, unfortunately as exceptionalized as, as somehow different. And they were certainly uh, different in many ways, but uh, uh, the resistance that they, uh, that they embody and that they uh, enact is of course much more broadly experienced. And so um, I wanted in these, uh, in these, in the digital project and in the book to reveal um, the experience of particular families and to make it possible that teachers could teach this material and students could use it and that no student in uh, Maryland or um, American history uh, courses would, would walk away from that course without knowing the names of families and individuals like Charles Mahoney. Charles Mahoney became, um, for me, just a heroic figure in the story uh, of the freedom suits. His freedom suit on behalf of his family um, and uh, his brothers and others um, lasts 12 years. Uh, it goes through three jury trials, uh, two courts of appeals to the Maryland High Court, and at one point, the jury in a Maryland court determines that Charles Mahoney is a free man. And this kind of documentary record here, uh, all of which um, we've digitized and made available through the website, um, at first, it's, a, it, it's in some ways a, yet another document from a court record. On the other hand, the more I worked with this and thought about this, um, here we have a, a relative of Charles Mahoney, a free black man, Peter Harbord, testifying in court on behalf of the claim that Charles Mahoney's ancestor, Anne Joyce, was a free woman and came from London. So a free black man is testifying. That's remarkable in and of itself. We need to know that, you know? And second, uh, Charles Mahoney is listed here at the bottom of this script as present in the courtroom. He's there. Um, and I gradually in this project um, realized that the truth we need to tell, of course, is that enslaved people, Charles Mahoney and others, were legal and political actors in their day and in their time and in their own right. And uh, I, I'm thinking here about Ta-Nehisi Coates's so important article in The Atlantic, The Case for Reparations, where uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates says something like, um, enslaved people were not inert. They were not waiting for freedom. They were legal and political actors. They, were, they, they acted in their day and time. And, um, and I think Charles Mahoney, and the freedom suit uh, history helps us see that. And I hope that that, that uh, is a truth that we, um, we, rec we, we reckon with. Um, so the goal of the project was to put these, uh, every document from every freedom suit I could co co find uh, into the website and make them available and shareable to, to everyone. Um, but, uh, this gradually uh, became a story for me and an experience for me of connection with the descendants of these families, as I, as I mentioned. I went to the liturgy uh, in 2017 at Georgetown that L Laura just referred to um, and met and talked with the descendants of the Queen family. The Queen freedom suits were at the center of the book I was writing. and. Um, and I wanted to hear from them and talk with them about uh, this history and share what I I found. Um, we're at, we're at time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll uh, 
I will take questions afterward, um, but just to say that uh, uh, that I thought I could do this at a, in a at a distance, and this became for me a, a very personal journey that I try to tell in the book. So uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. And now we have uh, Mrs. Julie Hawkins and us. Hey, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to start out like that because for the most part, you have heard my history. Um, everybody that's gotten up here has spoken about their research, uh, their books. I'm none of that. I'm not a professor. I'm not a researcher, college researcher. I'm a native Southern Maryland. I am from the place that you have just seen them show on this board. I don't have any PowerPoint because I want you all to act like I was when I was a kid with my grandparents and my mom and my dad. Um, my mother was from St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland. My dad was from Charles County. <clears throat> when I go home, and when I say home, I mean Southern Maryland. And now being from Southern Maryland, because our families migrated to Prince George's and Calvert and everything else, I consider myself from all of those counties because I grew up in all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so when people speak of Southern Maryland, you're talking about, or well, for me, being a native, you're not talking about people who have been there for 20 years to us or 40 years. My people go back to the original settlers, the Native Americans that came, and the Europeans who settled in St. Mary's County. Um, I <clears throat> take down a lot of notes because I always have a lot to say and I don't want to be here forever, but who am I? As I said, I'm a native Southern Marylander. Um, I grew up in St. Mary's County. My people were the enslaved who came from West Africa, who came through Baltimore and down, actually now I found out through research, through Anne Arundel County, down to St. Mary's County. My people are the enslaved who were sold to Louisiana. You know, you've been hearing a lot of stories, the GU 272, and at first, I didn't even know about it, to be quite honest. Um, I, I found out about it in 2016, I think it was on the news, that uh, Georgetown had found, um, I guess they, uh, the students there had found a list, of, what do you call it, shipping list, the shipping list. The manifest. Thank you, the manifest of families, whole families that were sold from Southern Maryland to Louisiana. I come from a family that is very proud of their uh, history, Southern Maryland history. And we always talk with well, my grandparents and aunts and elders in the community. They most of the time talked about the civil rights um, movement because they were very involved in that. I know people think Southern Maryland country rural. No, these people were smart folks, just like what you just heard about the Queen family. They were very progressive. They were very um, just strong people. So, but we never heard of, <laughs> Well, I never heard, I don't think any family from Southern Maryland has ever heard about the GU-272. I didn't. And as a matter of fact, uh, I think Laura just mentioned uh, Gonzaga High School, Eagles Fly High. My son went to that high school. He graduated from Gonzaga, is now at University of Michigan. So I'm kind of getting away from my notes. So let me, let me, let me go down through my notes because I talk so much. I don't want to, you know, um, get past my time. But just to tell you who I am. So... I'm now down to enslaved people who were sold to Louisiana. I also descend from free people of color in Maryland because a lot of times people think free people of color were only in Louisiana. No, they were like someone mentioned earlier, there was a large amount of free people of color. My family comes from that. Actually, one of my families lived, my, my grandfather's family lived by Newtown Manor that was just mentioned, you know, where the enslaved were sold. Well, they lived there as free people of color. So I'm still trying to research how they were free people of color. And right next door <laughs> was this manor that sold, you know, enslaved people to, um, to Louisiana. I also attended St. Francis Xavier. My, my, my main church at home in St. Mary's County is St. Aloysius, which is now called St. Aloysius Gonzaga, I saw. But that was my, my family church uh, on my grandfather's side. Mm -hmm. They went there, you know, back to the beginning of time, if you know anything about Catholic churches, and I'm Catholic, uh, they went to church with the whites, but just like society, it was 
segregated. You know, you know the black cell on one side, the white cell on the other. Um, I also descend from the early settlers that came through. Um, I go back to Lord Calvert. I go back to Princess Mary Keita Mukon. I always say her name wrong. That is my 10th great grandmother. Giles Brent is my 10th great grandfather who were Maryland, you know, if you anything, know anything about Maryland history, you will learn about Giles Brent, which also made Margaret Brent, who was the first um, woman to, I think, stand in court, correct? Stand in court. She's my uh, ninth great aunt. Um, so I'm saying all this to say, and I'm telling you about my history because I don't want to put this the wrong way. I'm noticing now we are being researched, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here listening to everybody. I'm like, you know what I'm talking about? My folks or people who have just discovered they descend from Southern Maryland. We're here. We're still here. I still have family at home. Um, I also descend from the Piscataway through Mary Keita McCall, but also if you, uh, if you know anything about Southern Maryland, their core names, they call them core names. They're Swans, Thompson, Harlots, et cetera. I, I'm a Swan. My great grandmother was a Swan. She was Native American. I'm also related to, if anyone here has heard of this person, I know Maryland folks have. Uh, my third great uh, uncle was Oswald Swan or Oswald or Oz, he had so many AKAs with that name, but he was actually, um, they describe him as Native American, but he was the person who helped John Wilkes Booth escape, I don't even want to say escape, but get through what was called the, the, the Kaya Swamp in Maryland, in Bryantown, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Bryantown, Maryland is where my father's family grew up and they lived maybe mm -hmm. maybe two, two miles from Samuel Mother, mm -hmm. who was the doctor, if you know the story, who helped uh, John Wilkes Booth with the his leg, am I correct? Oh, yeah. So, uh, and I rode past Dr. Mudd's house on a daily basis because my family is from that area. Um, so I, I guess that's why they asked me to come because I am, I like to say I am Southern Maryland and there are many families like me with such a variety and a diverse background. Um, growing up in Southern Maryland, uh, I was Catholic. So it's many traditions and cultures that we have, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about that one because when I grew up, I didn't know any other religion but Catholicism. That's all I knew. Um, it was our way of life, actually. Um, so uh, when I left to go to Old Dominion University, because I'm a graduate of Old Dominion University, that's when I discovered that Black people weren't supposed to be Catholic. I'm like, huh? <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, I wanted to sing. I, I'm a singer. And I wanted to sing in a, in a Black gospel choir because I had seen that on TV or somewhere. And when I told them I was Catholic, I thought everybody else was going to... I mean, I'm serious. We... I hope my grandmother, oh my God, <laughs> she, you could walk in the house and she would be saying the, you know, rosary or the novena. Uh, she was the one that when we lost something, we called her, hey, grandma, which saint is the one we need to get to intercede? Because I lost $300. <laughs> and it was like St. Anthony. And we pray to St. Anthony. St. Anthony come around, something's lost, it can't be found. And I swear that $300 would appear. That's just how we got. But my point is we were devout Catholics and like someone mentioned, we didn't know how, but we we kind of we knew because St. Mary's County was Catholic. We knew about because they were Catholic schools. I went to Father Andrew White, which was a Catholic school. My my mother did. My mother actually went to um, the black school in Southern Maryland, St. Mary's called Banneker. My father went to Pamunkey, which is in Charles County, which was the all black school or people of color. And um, but my grandmother went to Catholic school. And on back. So, I mean, my grandmother would be 100 if she was older. So, Catholicism is a very, it was our way of life. Um, I remember growing up, going to Father Andrew White when Easter came, the entire government shut down from Thursday until Sunday. We were out of school all week. And you know, that's how far back I go in Southern Maryland. Um, it, 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 that was just our life. I mean, my grandmother would call me at work. It would be Ash Wednesday. I could be sitting in a, in a meeting, to, you know, with directors, and she's calling me. It's Wednesday. Go get your ashes. Oh my God! She's calling her entire family. You know, <laughs> you know. I'm like, Grandma, I got it. You know, St. Patrick's Catholic Church. About I'll, I'll go. So, but I didn't learn until later, till 2016, that um, the Jesuits had sold enslaved people, and I grew up 
in my grand, my great grandmother's, you know, third great grandmother's house in Leonard Town. And I lived maybe four miles from Newtown Manor. I lived maybe four to five miles from Sodom Plantation, Tudor Hall, which was the library when I was growing up, but they call it Tudor Hall now. I think St. Mary's County Genealogical Society is there. We never heard that story. We heard other stories. You know, one of my grandmas always made sure that I knew I was Black Indian or Afro Indigenous, because her grandmother was Afro Indigenous. She was court to back Indian, which I now learned from an elder of the Piscataway who was very knowledgeable, uh, Mr. Rico Newman, that the Port de Basque was a, uh, a, a, they call it, a branch of the Piscataway, mm -hmm. band of Piscataway, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. So I heard about that, but this enslaved, being sold by Jesuit, my grandmother had just passed in 2016. I was so glad she wasn't alive to hear that because the respect that they had for that church I'm a bad Catholic, I'm gonna be honest. I didn't want to go to confession. I didn't want to do any of this. <laughs> and like, you know, a lot of my, my age group kind of left the church, but she was a devout Catholic, devout. I mean, so to find out that the Jesuit soul, family to Louisiana, I mean, these people were the closest thing to God for most Catholics, all Catholics actually, not, not me too much because I, I remember, I'm gonna tell this story when, um, I was in elementary school when they stopped having you go into the box. So if you're not Catholic, there's a box that you go into. You see it on like uh, the mafia movie when they go in. Yes, we. I used to be in the people's curtain and you so mystic in your, you know. And I remember one time I told my lie to my mom and stole bubble gum from highs, and I had to say five, have, you know, hail marys or whatever. And but so. When I was in about seventh grade, they changed that when you could sit face to face to the priest. You didn't have to go into the box. And I remember going in, and that's when I realized that I was always an inquisitive child and just always had a lot of questions. I'm like, why am I telling my sins to a man, you know, a human being? I don't want to go to confession anymore. And my grandmother went back and forth with me because, and I stopped going like in the eighth grade because I felt like, why should I tell this man my sins? And he looks just like me. In the box, it made it seem like God was there. <laughs> and, and you were threatened. And I stopped. But now we know that besides, um, you know, St. Mary's County or Southern Maryland being, you know, the seat of Catholicism, it was because the enslaved, you know, they, they were enslaved by Jesuits, of course, who were Catholic, and, and the families that were Catholic. So that's why that was passed on. Um, so what was it like growing up in St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland? Because I know she's going to get until I have time. Um, wonderful. We were kind of a hidden society for a minute. And it just pleases me that now everybody wants to know our history because there is a lot of history. You know, there's a lot of history in Southern Maryland. Actually, I go back to the Gentry family, the Eagland family of Charles County as well. Um, the seventh great granddaughter of William Borman on the white side, because I always split them out the white side, Navy side, and black side. <laughs> I, I really do. I mean, the Stone family just showed you that. They just discovered that. We knew it, but it was Ancestry that confirmed it. When I, when I go to Ancestry, I'm thinking, it's, you know, when I first went, I kind of knew because my father and everybody had told us about our backgrounds and whispered about when related to that white family down the street and, and we're Native American. I kind of knew. Ancestry confirmed a lot for me. It wasn't the other way around. And my grandparents that are dead now, it's amazing how they passed all of that down to us through oral history. And oral history is very important. Okay. It may the story may be off a little bit, you know, that they like to exaggerate, you know, you know, whatever. But for me, you know, that's what it was. So I, I'm here to represent, you know, the, the original or native Southern Maryland people and people who are doing research. Try to find out who they are because I, I I really do get a little bone of my you know what when I see people that aren't originally from native from Southern Maryland and want to tell our story. So I started a, a Facebook page. It's called um, I'm going to read it. It's called Family Reunion Southern Maryland People Our Connections and History. And I started that and I started around the GU two seven two discovery because I noticed Maryland folks weren't included. It was just Louisiana and the families going in, but they left somebody. They left us, mm -hmm. and we want to know who our family was that went over. I'm, I'm connected to the Mahoney's, the Barnes, 
the Yorkshire, you know, this, this is my black side, you know, mm -hmm. I say, this is my black side. I'm related to them. And, you, and, and we're finding that then some of the native folks, like I, I, I just got a, a notice that there was some proctors that may have also been a part of the GBT something. And the proctors in our community, uh, uh, some of them are considered as Native American, like the Swans and, and the Harleys and the Thompsons and so forth. <clears throat> But there's a lot of history. I will say this for researchers, don't ever think that there's a black side, there's a white side, and there's a native side. One of the problems I would run into on ancestry is connecting to a white person and they go, oh no, I'm not related to you. I'm like, lady, it says 72 CM. I think you, you're, you're connected to me somehow, okay? <laughs> it's, not, it's not split. There was so, inter, so much intermixing going on in Southern America, especially in rural areas. It happened. And for me, good, bad, or ugly, I'm here. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. You know, that's just, that's just the gist of it. And a lot of times, there are people that have information, white family, because I just got a letter uh, about a month ago, two month, months ago, from a family that held on to a letter that told stories about my, my grandmother and my grandfather. And it was the most amazing thing. Uh, I think they had worked for her. And she, uh, I want to say she was dying, but anyhow, my great aunt gave it. She gave it to my great aunt, who I think we're cousins. You know, I think she's my great aunt's cousin or my cousin, and she gave it to her, they gave it to me. So there's a lot of history to be shared. We just got to understand, and a lot of people have to come to terms with, you know, grandpa may have had a white family, but grandpa also had a black family down the street, whether it was good, bad, or ugly. So that's my gist, but I see her walking to towards me. And native <laughs> Southern Marylander. Uh, and, that's it. You can reach me on Facebook if you like Julie Hawkins and if you have any questions or if you ever want to speak to me or want to find somebody that's a native Southern Maryland to just reach out to me on Facebook under Julie Hawkins and mm -hmm. The only value in holding our speakers somewhat close to their time is that it opens the floor for questions. So that's the only reason that we uh, have to cut these stories short. Um, so questions from this community of people engaged with our Maryland speakers today. I just want to make a comment. I thought this was fantastic. I, I live in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. I've lived there for 30 some years. Two of my children went to St. Mary's College uh, of Southern Maryland. So that is just a really rich history. And uh, uh, Dr. Speckett, remember when I was talking to you yesterday and I was trying to recall this really great dramatic uh, dramatization of a film, uh, it was Dr. Uh, Thomas's yeah. film. So all of those connections to St. Mary's College, to uh, Prince George's County, to uh, the, the film, which is uh, really outstanding. Anna, uh, which film? Uh, it, it was the, the most... Uh, Dr. Thomas, you were at the uh, Greenbelt Theater in um, Greenbelt, Maryland uh, for Black History Month. Uh, yes. film that was shown uh, at the theater. Right. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's called The Bell Affair, and it's about the Bell family from Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, and they, they bring at least seven freedom suits, one of which goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, in the 1840s, and and they are really the family that, in many ways, is behind the Pearl uh, escape attempt in Washington D.C. in 1848. And so, uh, actually, the film will be shown in Washington D.C. on April 16th at uh, at a church, uh, uh, African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church in D.C. I and I can share that information with the the with the organizers of the Lemon Project uh, uh, conference to send out. But it's on April 16th in D.C. There's a Remember the Pearl event, and the film will be shown there. And it's a it's the story of of the freedom suits of the Bell family and then the Pearl escape. Yeah, and I would encourage people to to watch it because I think you all were very clever in filming this during the pandemic. So oh, uh, really, really creative. Was there a question in the web that none no. did? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Julie, okay. please. Okay. 
what's the chain that got you here today? Who connected you? How did all of that happen? Well, I, I, honestly, I, I was working for DHS, right? And I had to, to leave for the personal reasons. And a cousin of mine knew how I was always researching our history, our ancestry. If you came to my house, I just started talking about history. And everybody knew about that. And he was working for someone who happened to be a historian herself. He told her about me. Then I started getting involved with doing research in Southern Maryland. How I got to Amy, I don't know how I got to Amy, because everybody is pulling me now to help on a lot of like oral, oral histories and research projects in Southern Maryland. And I, I was, how did I get I to you? <laughs> I was, I know it's like Rochelle, him. Rochelle Prater yes. in yeah. Louisiana. Louisiana. And so I was, and she's a cousin of you, a BU two seven two cousin. What I'm discovering. So word of mouth. Yeah. Someone was referred me. I well, ultimately I came to yeah. And, and I think that's one of the, actually the great wealth of a symposium like this is mm -hmm. it points out the, the collaborations, not just within each site, but among sites. I mean, it, it's really quite amazing how all of these projects are interrelated and, and strengthen each other's stories here. Yes. Um, I apologize if you addressed it earlier, but can you expound a little bit on the comment that you said, the GU? It's called it's the Georgetown University. Oh. Um, I'll, it's, it's, it's different, group, but I know one is Georgetown Memory Project, okay. and you have the GU272, but it's the group that, that they found, it was certain families that were connected, or they, they were able to connect them to those families. Okay. And it's funny, because on the Louisiana side, there was one person that heard the story about her family coming from Maryland, being sold by Jesuits to Louisiana. Okay. So those families actually know exactly who the grandparents were, and and then uh, they 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 actually have on ancestry. They have what's called kits. So I was connecting to those kits. Now with me, I don't know exactly who yet mm -hmm. you know was either sold over or for me, I'm starting to believe I connected people who were sold. We we were we stayed here. I'm also starting to believe that it was a mix because some families had a mix of free people of color and enslaved. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking my free people of color connected to those who say, because I'm going to tell you something, my grandfather, whose family lived by Newtown Manor. Newtown Manor was one of the, the um, plantations, Jesuit plantations that sold the slaves. He used to tell me his great grandmother would say to him, you know, what's that saying? They sold some of us down the river. Mm -hmm. And he never understood it. He never understood it. And when this GU272 thing happened, mm -hmm. it clicked. I said, that's what his great grandmother was talking about. And evidently it was such a traumatic ex experience, people didn't talk about it at all. You know, because you, some people ran away. Not everybody got shipped to Louisiana. Some ran into the woods, I heard, you know, you know how to, and so I'm thinking the reason why we may not have heard about it, it was so traumatic. They stopped talking about that eventually, it just didn't even come up. Because I lived there where they were sold, and I, when they told me, like, huh? Not the, I'm gonna tell you something, as a Catholic, I went back and forth for a couple of years about leaving the Catholic Church. But the only reason I stayed, and that because it's, it's that's all I know. I'm be honest, that's all I know. What's, I, inter what's interesting about her story is uh, I submitted, um, this is early before I started getting more information. I submitted our information to the uh, Georgetown Memory Project, and she wrote back and said, oh, sorry, you're not part of it. And I'm like, how is that possible? I don't have the DNA yet. I can't figure it out. This is in the early days of 2016 or so. Um, but I had the locations. I had the the criteria that they're looking for. Everything. I have absolutely everything. And so uh, I still have the old letter that she responded back. And I don't know who she was. She was a project manager of the Georgetown Memory Project. And recently, um, I go back. You know, I circle back on all of our uh, old notes that we collect. And I said, let me just try one more time. And I'm looking this time at the word Georgetown Memory Project as a search. And all of a sudden, my family's connected. It's been connected. It has always been connected. She but no, no, she didn't. But here's what she told me. She said, Alan, this is quite unique. This is in the early days. She said, you don't connect to anybody uh, that, that's on our list. 
but you connect to the oppressors. Yes. So, 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 so I am from the other side. So she is from the other side. I am from the other side. No, 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 no. I get it. I get it. That's what yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. I think it's because I'm from the oppressor side. Yeah. Because, Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I hate to say it that and way. You're an yeah. oppressor and a slaver. But I'm yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. You wouldn't have to. You wouldn't have to. And, it's complicated. And I'm glad he said it out loud. Because yeah. I've done research. Yeah. I, so I think my bloodline to them. Yeah. It's from the oppressed and slavery. And see, we yeah. have to say it out loud. That's yeah, why yeah. we're here now. Yeah. 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 And, and, and the reason why we yeah. don't have that, well, what side, where were we from? That yeah. Was, because the records, people are mm -hmm. holding on to yeah. records. Yeah. Some people, when you approach them on ancestry, like you said, they shut you down. Yeah. They say, well, I don't need a 6 CM. If anyone is doing ancestry, the six CMs yeah. are very important. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let, 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 let me interject at this point okay. about the six okay. CMs, if you don't mind. That's okay. uh, let, let me let me just say this. A few years ago, um, Ancestry, and I'm not knocking those guys, they have a huge database. Uh, they they have to streamline occasionally. So what they decided to do, they they sent out a notice to all members and said, hey, we're going to streamline our database, our database down to 10 CMs or higher. Let's say something like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Ten, or more. Ten, or more. Ten, ten or more. So, so that connects me. Uh, for instance, like uh, you know, a number connects me to a number, right? Uh, and I'm I'm the math guy. I have a you know, background in engineering. That's what I'm from. So I'm I'm loving numbers. But if you take a number out of a system, so if I have one through one hundred and I take out number fifty, I have one through forty nine. It stops, drops off, and then it goes from fifty one to one hundred. There's a hole there, right? Well, Ancestry decided to take away the six CMs. That is your bridge. That's your, That's your bridge back home somewhere. That's a bridge. That's a number that continues. If there's a break in there, it doesn't continue. So what they tried to do was to break the, the, the chain of my history. So what we had a chance to do was to save the CMs before they, they gave a notice and said, you have 90 days to save, you know, whatever your work, your work is. If we're going to delete all the you know the information this is this is what's going on in the uh, ancestry world of the database world mm -hmm. so what i did for three months is i stayed up at night and i saved over three thousand cms at a, time. at a time you just can't click them and say one click and you're done walk away and go get some coffee it's one every individual you gotta click and save i saved over three thousand in my database alone and so because i did that i'm now Truly, I connect back to before Jamestown, Virginia. Mm -hmm. My family was here in 1500. Mm -hmm. I have documents that, that start at uh, 1680, uh, mm -hmm. Freedom Seeds, 1680, uh, with the Mozingo family. So if you heard of the Mozingo family, that goes back to Angola. It comes into the United States around 15 something. And 1619 is when they started recording this information. 1619, which is a, a huge project in Perth. And that's where Dr. Thomas was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Osbe, can you see? I'm oh, like, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know he's still on. Yeah. But um, that's where he came in because we were able to tie in that person who mm -hmm. connected with the European mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, yeah. it, to know that, yes, this is in fact. Yeah, that's right. Do you suspect that this, I mean, my mind automatically yeah. goes so, on. Was this streamlining? Uh, I, I, I was getting ready to comment that <laughs> and two comments I wanted to make. It truly showed how connected all of us are. And I think, and this is only an opinion because your that opinion has been thrown around. We started thinking that a lot of white families were complaining because they were connecting. Like you said, I got to tell the truth, people. Yeah. It's nothing against anybody in here. But I found my white family in Pittsburgh through Swan. I have a white family. I kept connecting to this lady who looked white, although where we come from, we can tell. Mm -hmm. Okay, you may not be able to tell, but because our families are so mixed, my father used to say, just look at the curl on their, on their neck, they're black. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say that, but I connected to her. She and I have the same, uh, we go back to uh, Oswell, I think Oswald Swan, I think they were brothers or something. And uh, they, so she just 
immediately distilled to me out. So, you know, you go on and say, hey, I just wonder how you're connected. Yeah. She said, can I call you? And she called me. She's like in her 80s now. I've known her now for about six years. She said, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, we had no idea that we had Black ancestry. By this time, she was completely white, but she had like, now I'm tell y'all, even some of the white people in here, if you see 3%, this is what I've learned. My cousin had 3% African or whatever, the rest of European. I'm starting to learn those 3% of cousins that I'm connecting to, their families passed. Their families passed. Somebody was mulatto or Black and passed. So she told me, she said, my, I found out after she actually stirred her family up. Her sister cried for days. This is what she tell me. She said, my sister cried for days because she realized they had black in them. And she did. I just, I was sitting on the phone, okay? And then she said that they found out that the third great-grandmother left Charles, I think it was three of them, left Charles County, went to Pittsburgh, passed for Italian and or white. Oh, yeah. And they didn't, she said that she... She knew something was up when she was a kid because one time she heard her grandparents uh, arguing in the kitchen and the grandmother called the grandfather, the N-word. She said, why is she calling my grandfather? He's white, you know? Mm -hmm. So my point is, America is more, I could speak for Southern Maryland, but I, about, we're more connected than you all think, okay? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I hope for me, and mind you, I found all this out during the Trump administration or the Trump he might be your brother. No, hold on. <laughs> I'm saying that because I'm saying that because I hope not. I'm saying that because when we we were all so happy to meet each other, right? We were all so I was even invited to they did a Southern Maryland um uh what was it at, at Bryan Town Church, what we call it Bryan Town Church, but it's actually St. Mary's Catholic Church. They did a whole reunion with the Eatland Jameson families and the person I connected to Tom Jameson thank you very much if he's watching but he determined that we were cousins invited us to the family we were the only people of color there and we we reconnected with that family which was great because if it wasn't for that family I was at a roadblock with my as they say mulatto great-grandfather we didn't know who his father was or anything it was in that family and Tom helped me helped us a whole lot to break that wall down which took us through the, the they call them the gentry families of Charles Town. So I'm related to the Eatlands that go to the Queens, and that's how I think I'm related to the Queens. Sometimes that goes to uh, the Marchands, that goes to the Brents, that goes to Mary Kingdom, Lucan, the Kaya. So that's how I get to them. But I'm learning that if you're going to do ancestry, if you can't handle the truth, you need to get off <laughs> because you block. You do. If you're if you if you're on there thinking you're yeah. just going to even for me when I went on there the first time I had no I mean when it popped it's white people but I was like oh my god all over the place I'll, and also I don't trust the algorithm I'll be honest yeah. because I notice sometimes it'll one minute you're um, I was Italian part Italian one time with maybe fifty percent Nigerian the that drug it's all over the place and I say that for Native American because I have some of my cousins who's Native American is coming up. Then others is not. So I don't even trust that sometimes with, with that. I don't, you know, but that's my spill on ancestry and, and people. You just have to work together if you're going to do this thing called genealogy research or, you know, family history. Research. I, I would just like to say we've had some good um, stories come out of, of finding our cousins. Uh, one in particular, uh, I found a cousin on my my uh, father's, well, the father's side, they were fights. They began in Virginia. And also, um, the Fife married a Hawkins, Julie Hawkins Ennis, out of Virginia. So we're going to look at ancestry and see, you know, where that connection is. And they, um, the Phyllis was Phyllis Hawkins, my uh, third great grandmother, was Native American. We found her on the Free People of Color of, uh, on the Dog Roads, going to Oklahoma. Yes, we found her just recently. And then there's a, uh, we have found cousins that we have connected to. Uh, Alan brought one with him today that we never, you know, knew that was a cousin. Um, I have found, found people who actually lived in Baltimore. Uh, and I didn't know that they were cousins. They came to our reunion, our 83rd reunion. We've been doing this reunion for 83 years and didn't know all of the cousins. How does that happen? Well, now we know. And, and so uh, the uh, five that I found, she's, she's a researcher. 
and she calls me cousin. She's a white woman. We text each other. We call each other on the phone, you know, and she's, yeah, it's so it's, it can be enlightening and when, and you, it, it just takes away all that. You know, actually, who am I? Well, it's actually a beautiful thing. I was going to say, when yeah, I met, met my white cousin who was doing the Trump campaign and we were all kumbaya on Facebook <laughs> until somebody brought up politics. Oh, no, oh, yeah. no, I had cousins, white cousins, family, black cousins. <laughs> who did this white dude? That's your cousin. But he said something. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, that just shows you the diversity of who we are, you know? And I want to put this, but I didn't mention this up here. So where I come from in Southern Maryland, we have a ham that's indigenous to us called stuffed ham. My grandmother made the best. If you ever come to Southern Maryland, please ask for that because I, I really had to put that in there. It's called stuffed ham. It's stuffed with collard greens, kale, cabbage with spices and the, the history behind that, several histories. You got one that it came from England, the other that it came from enslaved people who had to, you know, spice up good with the hog's head. But that is indigenous to St. Mary's County. My, my child, I mean, it's so indigenous that my Charles County grandmother didn't even cook it, but my St. Mary's County did. We had it every holiday. But I wanted to throw that in as a, as a native Southern Maryland. <laughs> that, that is the perfect segue in lunch. <laughs> so you might be having lunch with all of your cousins. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to this session. And Thank you.